first off, I, uh, I just want to say that I'm a big fan of your writing and of your work. Uh, like your letter to your younger self is very touching. Thank you. Uh, and um, I really like the way you write about what you see is what you use. Uh, and I can see that in the Facebook product, like what you guys push and what you guys don't push. Um, anyway, I want to get uh, to questions related to management and, and startups. Uh, so you're pretty successful and pretty young for like getting into such a good state, right? Like you're a VP of design of Facebook. Uh, you probably manage people that are like people that are older than you. How do you manage them and how do you, you know, uh, uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think it's actually extremely common, you know. Um, oftentimes in Silicon Valley, I think we're very fortunate to be able to work in an environment oftentimes where, you know, something starts out as like, uh, you know, like a dream or as, a, as an idea. And very soon, because you can rally a couple of other people who are interested in the idea, suddenly you're managing, right? And suddenly you've got a team. And really, uh, the way that I define management is just how do you get great outcomes from a team of people working together? You know, that's, that's what it is, simply, right? It's, it's about uh, ensuring that, you know, this team is aligned on what success looks like, um, that it has the right skills and capabilities uh, and that it has the right, you know, processes uh, to be able to do good work and achieve the goals that the team has. And so, uh, I think that uh, you know, because I, mean, I think management as a as a general concept is is something that I feel like you know, because we grew up watching movies or we grew up having bosses of our own or you know, our parents had bosses. That it's something that we go into with like a maybe like a bunch of assumptions about like what the job is or what it means to be a good manager. Uh, and I find that it's super helpful to just go back to actually if you just think about it as like first principles. It's about uh, like it's a group of people, there's a goal, how do you help this group of people achieve this goal in the fastest, most efficient, most high quality way possible, then it doesn't have to be about, you know, uh, how much you know, how skilled you are, how authoritative. It's just about, okay, cool, like how do I understand the needs of this group of people and how do I make that happen? And so I find you know, you know, with the assumption of this question is just like um, a lot of times if you're managing someone who's older than you, it, it like can feel awkward, right? Because it's like maybe that person is more experienced and they know more than you, they're more skilled than you. And so like what value can you contribute to them, right? What can you possibly teach them, you know, and, and how are they going to, how are you going to earn their respect if they, if like, you know, you, ought to, you don't have those skills. But I think there's a lot of ways to actually you know, manage someone and be helpful to someone. I mean, we talked about kind of the, the definition of mentorship earlier. That doesn't have to be that, you know, you have to somehow prove that you're more skilled or talented in this particular way. I think oftentimes in managing someone who's experienced and older, it's like, A, celebrate that. You've got someone on the team who is gonna bring their skills and expertise and, and help the team reach its goals. That's a great thing, right? But my number two, you know, I think it's, be okay with the fact that like, yeah, you do want your team to, to have skills and be better at you than certain, uh, at, at certain things. Um, the third thing is it's still, you know, go and talk to that person and, and try and understand what is that person looking for? You know, why are they interested in this job? How do they want to grow in their career? What opportunities do they want to be able to, uh, you know, uh, expand and, and stretch? What, you know, goals are they hoping to achieve? And you listen to that and you help them occasionally and sometimes find, you know, find those opportunities. Give them the big projects or the initiatives that they can lead. And you can do that as a manager, even if this person, you know, if you think that you know, they're, they're so much more skilled and talented than you. So I would say the basic thing is just it, get, it goes back to trying to understand what that person cares about, what the team needs to do, and how you can make that happen, you know, how you can connect people to the projects and to the goals that are going to help make the team successful. So sometimes uh, your employee or the person that you're managing is doing great, but sometimes the person is underperforming and whatnot, right? How do you decide when to fire or how to uh, keep someone? And let's say that the worst case scenario happens and you have to fire someone. How do you communicate that to the team and how do you deal with that? 
Yeah, so this is uh, obviously not the most pleasant uh, or the favorite thing that managers have to do, but I think it is important because honestly, sometimes it's just not a good fit. And I think it's important to look at it as a matter of fit, right? So my analogy is sort of, you know, imagine all the people that you could date. You know, there might be another person out there, perfectly great person, you know, like, you know, great personality, financially responsible, funny, but it's just not someone you would want to date because of, you know, maybe you have different values in life or, you know, maybe just, uh, it's like you, you have the personalities like have a mismatch or whatnot. It is not a judgment on that person. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean they're a failure. It doesn't mean whatever. It is sometimes just a matter of fit. And I find it's always helpful to think of, you know, the relationship that people have with teams in that manner, right? You know, you have a team, you're managing this team. It has a particular goal. It maybe has particular values, you know, that you or the organization at, at large has defined, you know, particular norms around how it wants to work and, and what it cares about. Then you have a person, you know, and perhaps it is just the case that what the team needs to be successful and how it wants to operate and how what that person is looking for or what their skills are or what they care about is not a fit. And in that case, it is like, just like, you know, if you're dating with someone, like, it is okay to have the conversation and it is, you know, and, and it is okay to go into that with respect and with compassion and with the understanding that, you know, this might actually be what is best for everyone, right? I find that there's generally a few reasons why someone is underperforming. The first is they don't have the right skills for the job, you know? You are needing X for, in order for your team to be successful. They don't have the skill that, that you need or maybe at the level that you need and so it's just not a good match and, and therefore you know you have that conversation. Sometimes the skills can be learned, you know, sometimes you can train over a period of time and help them get there, like especially if it's around communication style or, or, or some of those softer things. Sometimes it can't be because it's not reasonable to expect that even with the best coaching, they're gonna be at the level that you need in you know, three months or six months. And it, so it's just, it, it won't make sense uh, to, to kind of you know, use coaching as a way to get there. And I think you can be very frank about what does the job need or what does the team need and what is the, the skill mismatch. Sometimes it's not a matter of skill, it's just a matter of motivation, right? So maybe the person is skilled, can do the job, but isn't working hard enough or isn't, um, I don't know, isn't coming to the office with, with passion or, or, or whatnot. And it's okay to have that conversation too, to sort of, you know, recognize like, hey, it just, you know, it's like you definitely can do it, but it feels like, you know, it, it, it's, like you, it's, like, it's like you kind of maybe don't want to or you're not particularly motivated. And like, why is that? And oftentimes there's a root cause, you know, you know, and sometimes these causes are temporary. That person is going through a really, you know, stressful time at home. And if, you know, and, and, and so sometimes, you know, you, you kind of have to help, help support them through that because it's like a, you know, it's a, it's a something out of the ordinary, right? And, and you know, we all go through these ups and downs. And so it's, it's a temporary thing. But sometimes you, dis you discover that the thing that person really, really cares about is not what this company or this team is about. You know, sometimes you find that what their values are or what their goals are just isn't aligned with what the team can give them and what can they can provide. And it's also okay to just have that direct conversation and to get to the conclusion that maybe this person would be better off elsewhere and, and maybe the team would be better off uh, as well. So, you know, so uh, I think those are the ways that you sort of go and approach the conversation, right? Um, and, you know, and I think the hardest is, of course, if there's a mismatch, if, you know, you don't think they have the skills, but they really think they do, then yes, sometimes, you know, that, that can be a bit of a harder conversation uh, because you don't think they're right, but they really, really don't want to lose the job or they don't really want to be asked uh, to leave. But I find that it's always most helpful to go into the conversation and be very direct about what's the problem. You know, like, is it a skills gap? Does it seem like a motivation thing? And just be curious about where that other person is, but also be very clear about, you know, this is what the role needs or what the team needs. Um, and, and to do it in a way that still respects that the other person can be hugely successful in another role on another project with another team and another set of values. You know, just because they didn't work out for you and your team doesn't mean that they're a failure in other parts. Um, I think that's the hardest part because oftentimes people 
feel like a failure when you know you have that conversation with them about underperformance. Um, and I find you know, but I know many people who have had that conversation with their manager who have maybe you know left a company but actually still continue to have great relationships with their manager because it was such a human way to have that conversation. Cool. Um, so talking about tough moments, right? Like there are tough moments when you fire someone or someone that you really like uh, leaves the company or you know in general there, there might be tough moments, there are bumps in the road. How do you deal with that and how do you deal with your team when you're feeling you're not feeling as motivated, right? Like, how do you push forward and how do you? When you yourself aren't motivated or when you feel like the team is um, not motivated? Uh, both. Yeah. So, yeah, I think when the team is not motivated, it's more important because, yeah. yeah. Uh, when the team is not motivated, you know, uh, I've, I think what, what helps the most is just to honestly, uh, like, address that directly. You know, I know a lot of times, you know, people, Managers feel like they shouldn't like talk about bad news, or they shouldn't necessarily like if, you know like call attention to problems. And I actually find that you know it's it's a lot better to be kind of direct because if everyone's kind of unmotivated because of you know let's say like a bad press article or because like the results uh, you know are not good or you know the team's not meeting its revenue numbers or, or whatnot, like it's it's like as a leader you you don't want to sweep those things under the rug and assume that people aren't thinking or talking about them because they are. Um, it's always better to try and address, you know, the, the core, to acknowledge, right, that that is the feeling, you know, to say, hey, this is tough for us right now because we aren't meeting our numbers, or it's tough for us right now because, you know, we had a, a bad launch or, or whatnot. Um, but then to go back to kind of the why, and I think this is so important for every leader, is to, is to like, go and, and really dig down to understand, well, why, why is our team here, you know? Why were we formed, or why is our organization trying to do, like, you know, teams and organizations get started because there's like a mission, or there's like a North Star, or there's like an aspiration, right? There was some problem in the world that, you know, you and a group of people wanted to solve, or there's some, you know, understanding of like the ideal or the North Star that everyone's working towards. Uh, and I think it's really important to go and go back to that, you know, go back and help remind people this is why we wake up every morning. And if that is still something that's exciting, you know, if we still believe this is an important problem to solve and we still believe that, you know, we can try new things to be able to solve it, then, you know, let's get back up and let's, let's, let's keep working at it. Um, you know, every, all of us, every company is going to go through those moments of failure or doubt or when things don't go according to plan. But I think the companies and teams that succeed are the ones for whom the mission and the why is, is always top of mind. And it's always something that you know, continues to be a motivating factor for, for, um, for the, the fact that we get out of bed and do this job every day. Interesting. So as a VP of design on Facebook, you probably came across the best talent in the world, right? Uh, and you, you probably know where the best engineers come from, right? Uh, as a startup, a lot of people here are starting their own companies and whatnot, and they need to find the best designers. How do they find the best designers, and how do they source them? That's a tricky, that's a great question, because I feel like design, as well as analytics and research right now, are probably, um, you know, uh, and in engineering too at large is, is one of those areas where there's a lot more uh, demand than there is supply. <laughs> you know, I know like every week I'm talking to, you know, tons of companies and there are like so many head of design roles or, or you know, product design roles available. And I think that's exciting because, you know, it's like I think everyone's recognizing that um, being, you know, being extremely data uh, oriented or, or being very user focused or sort of understanding how to uh, create uh, usable um, and beautiful products are like good differentiators, you know, and it's it's part of what is almost the expectation now for uh, companies. So yeah, there's de there's definitely like an unequal marketplace. Um, I think hope, you know over these years, as this becomes a more attractive field, we'll see more people get into it, um, and it'll equalize out uh, as as all marketplaces do. But I would say that right now, for the time being, um, you know, the best designers that I know are, uh, there's, there's probably two tactics that you can use. The first is uh, just to, 
you know, have a really compelling mission um, that uh, that very clearly explains like what the value for end you know pe for end consumers are. I know that uh, you know in particular for designers, and I am making some sweeping generalizations here, so please bear with me. Um, a lot of what motivates them, you know, a lot more so than like you know, money or, or, or a procedure or whatnot is the idea that they are working on something they are proud of, that, they, that it has meaning in the world, and that it is done in a way that appeals to their design values. You know, it's like, and oftentimes what those design values are, are like attention to detail, attention to craft, you know, a lot of like actual, um, uh, I think, respect for the user experience, including, you know, the the end-to-end -end experience for an individual person using this at an individual place. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes companies that have, that really have those values or espouse those values, you know, we're trying to do something meaningful and we care a lot about, you know, the experience that end users have, they tend to, you know, that shows in the work and that tends to attract the like-minded people who, who have, um, uh, who, you know, want to live by those values, right? So, so I think that's the first part is just, Tell your story, make it clear, you know, like care about design, learn more about, about it, um, and be able to, to speak the language of like why, you know, user experience matters and why, you know, the, the care and attention on, a, on user experience matters to you and your company. I think the second thing to uh, other uh, strategy I would advise is just sometimes, you know, it's like take a bet on, on young designers. Um, there are a lot of great, you know, people with strong aesthetic sense uh, and coming out of design schools. They don't often have the experience, you know, that I know uh, many companies ideally would like, right? Because you talk to companies and they want like the unicorn designer, they want someone who's like built all, you know, has tons of experience building all these other software startups and is, you know, uh, really awesome and is like ready to, to kind of do their own thing. There just aren't that many of them uh, uh, out there. But there are tons and tons of people coming out of design schools, you know, or or are quite early in their career, um, who maybe don't have the full range of skills. You know, maybe they're really strong at aesthetics and visuals, but they haven't honestly built that end-to-end -end product and user experience. And many of them are going to go and 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 be great. And when you know they have that experience, and you give them two, three, or four years, you know, they will learn. And it pretty much, you know, I think at Facebook we've seen this over and over again. People will come in as new grads. In four years, they become, you know, I would say some of the most, you know, senior and talented designers out there in the industry, right? It's a fast-moving industry, and you know, you just have to get your hands dirty for that period of time. And for us, you know, one of our strategies is we invest a ton in um, our early career designers, in new grads, and we, you know, try and, and give them the ability to learn and to, you know, occasionally make mistakes, uh, but, but to go through that process. Interesting. Uh, so let's say that you came across someone that seems great. How do you figure out that that person is actually going to do good work? How do you interview that person? And how do you figure out that that designer is actually going to contribute a lot for, for your company and not going to underperform or, you know? Yeah. I think it really also depends on like what um, particular design skills or, you know, that you're looking for. Right, um, and you know that varies from company to company. Um, I would say that, uh, and I, I think it's you know pretty important to like have that be part of the conversation up front. So I know there are some companies who are like, look, we know exactly what we want to do. We have a very clear understanding of our product strategy. We, you know, and so we're looking for someone to just kind of like help, you know, uh, uh, plan out the interactions and really, you know, help us like with the strong visuals and a brand identity. And in that case, you know, make sure you're interviewing, like, ask them questions around brand identity. Look, you know, um, ask them, you know, what they think is is awesome in the universe of, you know, brand identities. Right? Ask them, I think, questions related to um, that give you a sense of their expertise and the particular skills that you're looking for. If you're looking for a designer, that's much more about product strategy, <laughs> and that can help you, you know, actually understand what are the user features to build or what is the uh, set of, you know. Um, uh, uh, products to offer, then, then you know, um, uh, I think talk to them about about like you know what do they admire in the market. I find some of the best questions to ask designers 
about are like have them walk you through some work that they've done. You know, even if it's a you know new grad designer, it's like they've done work in college. Like have them walk you through their process, their thinking, and just you know get a sense of like how like what are the values and considerations uh, that are leading to the decisions that they're making in the design. Um, so always look, ask for past work, always ask for a portfolio. I think the second thing is, uh, you know, it's always uh, helpful to ask designers as well, like, uh, what are the products that they feel are, are really great in the, in the dimension that you're looking for? So if it's like, hey, you know, I'm looking for, uh, you know, inventiveness in like, you know, the user interface, it's like ask them what they admire, right, on the market. Ask them to pull it out on their phone and show you and talk through it and critique it, you know? Uh, or if you want um, someone who you know, really understands visuals or brand identity, ask them what their favorite brand identities are and ask them to explain why. You know, like, you know, put four logos up and be like, which of these do you think is the strongest and why? And being able to actually, I think, critique um, products, uh, you know, logos, you know, brand identities or, or other things on the spot is often a good way to sort of understand someone's thinking. So let's say that you got this amazing designer and now you're working with that person and now you need to get everyone on the same page you have the engineer you have the designer and you have maybe the product person or the ceo how do you make sure that they're all in sync right that we're all walking towards the same goal and everyone understands uh each other's work and everyone is basically working at the same pace or yeah I think the most important thing is to just ensure everyone has a clear definition of what a successful outcome looks like. I mean, this sounds so easy and obvious, but I just actually, I find that oftentimes, you know, if you like imagine a particular team, like if you guys were working a team or like, imagine that you just went and asked, you know, like person A on your team, hey, like in one year, in three years, in five years, like what does it look like if we are, you know, wildly successful, right? What would it like feel like? What would it look like? What would we have accomplished? I find that oftentimes when you ask like three people on the same team this question, you just get three different answers, and that ju that you know ends up pointing to the fact that there's not actual extreme clarity on uh, what a successful outcome looks like, and also what a success looks like on on kind of multiple time frames, right? And I think that's extremely important to try and define even at the level of a particular project, you know? So uh, so at the very highest level, it's like, okay, so like, you know, we started this team, this company, this organization with a particular mission. Like, what does it look like if we've like actually achieved the ideal? You know, can it be, um, care, you know, summarized in, in one word or three words? Uh, I know early days at Facebook, like, you know, one of the things that was super motivating for everyone is that like, you know, even when we were like 20 million users and it was like mostly college and high school students, you know, Mark was throwing around the number a billion. One day we'll connect a billion people. And I felt like everyone at the company like was super inspired by that and sort of understood that. So it wasn't like we would be happy just because we had beat, you know, MySpace. We wouldn't be happy because we were just the biggest social network. We wouldn't even be happy if we were like the best with college students and then we had, you know, maybe graduated to, it was like this very audacious, bold goal that was, you know, at once you could like ask yourself, are we a billion people? Yes or no? No. Okay, we're, there's work to do. You know, like we haven't reached it there. Um, and so, so I think finding a way just to even encapsulate the very highest level, like what that is. But then that even, I think, recurses all the way down to like projects, right? So we're all working on a project. It's like, are we all clear on like, what is the timeline that we think should be success? Or what does the first milestone look like? And what it, you know, and if we go and we ship it and we get test results back, have we discussed prior to us launching the experiment, what do we, like, what results are we looking for that would make us all feel that, you know, we were doing a great job, an okay job, a mediocre job, right? And, and I think if you don't talk about it, it's like people, like, you, we can all look at the same set of numbers and actually have totally different interpretations. You know, maybe I think this is awesome and you think it's not so good and it's because we came in with different expectations and it just really helps to, I think, ensure that um, expectations as well as an understanding of success, uh, you know, at, at every level and on every time frame is clear among the team. I see. I think that's going to be my last question and I will open up to uh, the audience to ask questions. So. Uh, talking a little bit about design, uh, there, there are companies that uh, 
achieve their goals differently, right? There are some companies that uh, do A-B testing. There are companies that are totally against A-B testing. Uh, I know, for example, Facebook, the Facebook app has, um, I think, uh, they run different tests all the time. They test out the app in New Zealand first, or, uh, you know. Uh, what's your view uh, on A-B testing, and like, does that affect how you're going to decide uh, how the product is going to look like? And Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think A-B testing is a wonderful tool. Um, I think like all tools, you know, you have to understand what is the right context to use it. And, and yes, we could all misuse tools, and then therefore we don't get the, uh, a great outcome. Um, I think it's also interesting to sort of contextualize like where Facebook is, you know, as a company, right? Because, you know, when we started and when, you know, I think most companies start, it's like you don't, even if you wanted to, it's like you don't necessarily have the resources to do any A-B testing. But more than that, oftentimes the biggest insights that are game changing are ones that are sort of, you know, it's like you've identified a particular problem and you think you have a great solution and therefore you're going to go and trust your intuition and build this big idea, right? I mean, that's... You know, most startups or companies that are, that are successful like starts with like a big a problem and a big idea and like a leap of faith that this is like a better way to solve the idea. They didn't get it there by like A/B testing their way into a big idea. You know, it always starts with some intuition um, about the market and what people need. And I think most great leaps of uh, you know uh, forward progress like start in that manner, right? You, you know, you you I think have to take a leap of faith with your understanding of you know, what people want, what's missing, what's an important problem, you know, what do people uh, want to solve, and what is a better shape of a solution than anything else that exists uh, you know, uh, on the market or any other alternative today. Now, when Facebook, and so we did this, you know, we, and we, we launched Facebook, um, a lot of those early, I think, successes for Facebook were built with, those, with that kind of intuitive model. You know, new, newsfeed was from the idea was from you know the observation that oftentimes when people came to Facebook, they would then go to check out their ten friend, you know, ten or twenty best friends profile, and they would do this habitual pattern every day because they wanted to see if there were any updates. And then we were like, wait a second, maybe we should just show you all the updates in one place so you don't have to do this, you know, ten or twenty um, uh, 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 profile visits, right? Um, you know, uh, a lot, you know, uh, photos and sharing photos and tagging people came from this intuition that, like, actually the thing that matters the most in most photos isn't, like, the composition and, you know, how high res it was and, you know, whether it was, like, aesthetically beautiful. Most people just care about photos because it's, like, who are the people in them? And it reminds them of a, a great memory that they had with people that they cared about, you know, friends and family, right? Um, and so, you know, knowing which people were in the photos and, and getting notified when someone told, you know, put you in the photo, like that, those all came from, I think, intuitive observations. And so those were a lot of the early bets. And, you know, happily, many of them were successful and, and spoke to a need in the market. But as Facebook scales, you know, it's like, uh, you know, and we started to introduce the, the service to many more countries, many more types of users. You know, we went beyond college users. We went to, um, uh, 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 you know, demographics that maybe were getting onto web for the first time, or you know, maybe a little bit less savvy. Then, a lot of then what that ha what happens is you start to like try to understand how to scale or optimize the product, right? Uh, because, you know, you could always like this was working. That general idea is working. It has product market fit. Now let's optimize and let's figure out how to you know grow it for more people. And you know, over time, your intuitions as your service scales just become less and less good. It's very hard for you know me to understand what is going to work best for somebody who lives in like a village in Indonesia because I'm not that person, you know. I could intuit all the stuff about photos and co what college students want because I was of that demographic and I understood those problems really well. But if I'm designing for a completely different, you know, use case um, and it's like someone who just got their first, you know, access to data and, uh, and is, is like logging online and, and is trying to figure out how to use Facebook. I, I don't have a great intuition about what that person needs or, or wants. And so when we don't have a great intuition that we can often, but we're also dealing with, you know, how do we optimize, let's say, a registration flow or how do we optimize, you know, a particular uh, interface that asks people to, you know, 
tag photos, then it is super helpful to run a bunch of you know, different variants, try a bunch of different hypotheses out, right? Uh, and then, you know, A-B test and, and um, you know, understand uh, what works and what doesn't. Like, I could tell you today, you know, I, like having seen even at this point millions of, you know, or uh, of different, probably that's an exaggeration, but like hundreds, thousands of experiments, you know, on just like little things like, you know, button placement and like colors and icons. I still get surprised all the time by the results of A-B tests, and just because you know this is such a huge demographic that we're dealing with, um, that you know it's very it's very hard to intuit your way into the best optimizations. And I think that is where A-B test testing really shines. It's for um, I think smaller iterations on a, th a thing that's generally working, uh, and you're trying to figure out how to make it work better. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, with that, I want to open up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, as someone who's about to exit college, I guess one of the things that I personally think about and feel like a few people in my peer group really think about is we're really at a position of privilege where we can choose to pick whether or not we want a great team, which could be a you know, proxy for having a great manager, or for going to a great company uh -huh. which whose values are and whose mission we really believe in. But it's very rare, I would say, that you kind of get the perfect of both. And so I can, I'm kind of wondering what you would give in terms of advice to your 20-year-old self if you were in a similar position oh. um, in terms of both, you know, how your quality of life would be, but also from a career perspective and what has tended to work better for mm -hmm. people. So this might be an unsatisfying answer, but I think if I could go back and you know tell myself who is you know in your position today, I think the the short of it is it doesn't matter that much, and and the thing you should do is just <laughs> try different things. You no, know, seriously, like try because you know in that stage of your twenties and early thirties, a lot of it is just about discovering kind of what you care about the most, right? And being able to get to answering questions like, do I? Is it ultimately more fulfilling for me to work with people I love, even if I'm like, you know, care less about the problem, or is it like that I'm, you know, super driven by the particular problem and I'll like make it work? And oftentimes you can't, you just, you don't know those things because you haven't gone, you know, through and, and uh, had those experiences or tried them. I know that, like, you know, as much as I, I think, wanted to understand the best path forward, you know, and, and really try and optimize it in my 20s. Like, I don't think I understood myself well enough. Um, and also, you know, what you care about and the, those preferences change, right, as, 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 as life happens um, and as you gain more experience. And so I think the thing is just it's okay to, you know, just to try all sorts of different, you know, and, and go on a leap, right, uh, and, and to kind of follow your gut and know that this isn't forever. You know, you can go and join this company and this team, you'll learn a lot. The most important thing is probably to try and maximize your learnings, you know, both about yourself as a person, but about your skills and about, you know, kind of, again, the world at large and what you care about, and then go and try something else. You know, it isn't forever. And it's going to be okay for you to find yourself in situations that maybe aren't ideal, but then you'll realize that they aren't and you'll avoid those in the future and you'll be better off for it. Facebook, do you have a chance to, I guess, you know, upskill yourself in design practice? And then so with that being said, also, do you have any foresight on things like computational design or, or the future of design? Uh, I would say that I am a terrible IC designer at this point. <laughs> um, uh, and you should not you know, hire me or expect me to, you know, actually design a great, great UI. Um, and part of it is just, you know, I think with any you know, practice that you don't do for prolonged periods, it's like the tools change, right? The, like, you know, when I started, when I was an IC designer, it's like we were all still using Photoshop. These days, nobody uses Photoshop uh, for UI interface design because you're using Sketch and you're using Framer and you're doing kind of advanced prototyping. So there's even just the basics of keeping up with the, the norms um, that, you know, I, I haven't done. I would say that the thing I continue to try and grow in in my skill is my eye. And what that means is just my, my critical ability to 
evaluate a design, right? About whether it's on an aesthetic dimension, visual dimension, you know, inner um, ease of use dimension, or even just like product strategy dimension. And that is the thing that I continue to, you know, learn and hone and uh, and try and get better. Um, so that I can pr continue to you know, provide good feedback uh, uh, in the work that I'm seeing. And so in that way, I, do, I still feel like I've grown a lot over the years and con continue. I have a question actually about management and leadership, um, especially at early stage startups. Um, there was a tweet recently by, from like one of the Stripe co-founders, Patrick Carlson, and Paul Graham mentioned it too. I'm not sure if you saw it, but it was regarding work ethic at like early stage startups. Um, and I'm curious, like, your experience, like, at an early stage at Facebook, like, if it aligns with that, and also how to build that type of, you know, work ethic for a successful startup. And what, what was the tweet? Um, he was basically saying that um, while, while long work hours is not a metric to judge a team by, um, working hard is actually really important. And he says that Stripe basically would not be where they are had they not worked this hard, and that it was pretty crucial for them. Um, that was like the main like ethos of that. So the point was around that startups are generally more successful if people work harder. Yeah, and I'm just curious like the culture at other early stage startups because most of the time that you, for mo at least for most people, like are aware of the successful startups, they've already gone over that hump and everything prior to that is now like a really good story. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean I've only worked at like one startup, so it's like I wouldn't generalize my uh, my uh, answers. That you know, I'm reaching each time in here because we were at the same place. Uh, you've actually been at more startups than I have. So. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, uh, yeah, I think in the early, I think a lot of times, you know, it's just at least at Facebook, the experience was like, there was a group of people, we were all like really, really into what we were doing. Like we were really excited by it. It was like a product that we were all using. You know, we like lived, breathed, and dreamed it. It was like, it was, it's like on weekends, it's like all we wanted to do was talk about the product, you know, with, with our friends. And so in that manner, like, you know, we, yes, we, we all did work very hard. And, you know, it was uh, because I think we all cared so much about it. Um, uh, and also, you know, most of us at that time were quite young, and so we didn't have like a bunch of other obligations, right? It's like we had come out of college. Many of us were already very used to, you know, cramming for exams, for, you know, and, and like doing the like eight hour marathon to finish a paper at like 2 a.m., you know? And so this was like, it just, it was like an extension in a lot of ways of uh, the, the kind of things that we were doing in college. Um, so that was the experience that I have. It's hard to like, I think, generalize that to like, do you have, like if you didn't, you know, work those hours or if you, you know, didn't. Uh, but I do think that, yeah, most startups, I would assume are successful because people really care and have that passion and are willing to go the extra mile. I don't know that that means that they, you know, it's like you have to actually put in the hours because I think if you just make people stay long hours and work, but there's not that motivation, or there's, you know, um, or it just is versus like you're checking a box, um, or you're not working, you know, in a, in a super smart way, like, then th I don't think you get the outcome uh, uh, that you want. Um, I also do know, I think, some other friends who later have gone on to do startups, and, you know, some of them make different choices, right? And that might be also because they're at different phases of their life, and, you know, they have the experience of, of like, knowing how to you know, uh, within, let's say, if you get an eight hour block, how to like maximize it so that, you know, you're actually getting um, uh, maximal output out of it. And I know that when I was 22, I, I wasn't working as efficiently um, as I think I've learned to do over the years. And, you know, it, I think it, 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 I think the thing that probably matters the most is like, do people really care? And is there that passion and that willingness to, to do what, um, what, you know, it, it feels like you need to do to make this succeed? So I have a question related to uh, building a, like a design-focused culture at a small startup. So suppose I'm like a designer at a small startup, and I have a team of you know a handful of engineers. And we're doing things that a small startup does. We're iterating on our product. We're building it out. We're trying to find potential customers, but we're also doing things like we're uh, recruiting and hiring new people to our team. 
just wondering uh, all, all the and all the craziness that comes along with a small startup. Um, how do you keep the user and the way we design the product kind of in the forefront of everyone's minds and conversations? Uh, what are some things you might do? I mean, I think that it. I think the first thing is just to like, you know, it's like how do you talk about the product, right? If you talk about it as like a series of you know features or you know a series of numbers, then it's often yeah, like, it's going to be like harder to kind of or easier to lose the thread of like, okay, you know, what is, what's the user experience and is it a holistic journey and are we, you know, doing the right thing? I think if you talk about it by like over and over again, it's like, this is a problem that people have. This is a problem that we're trying to solve. Like we can, here's what like, you know, the user journey looks like today to, you know, like that, like it's like, you know, people are using these alternatives or these hacks to solve this problem. And by the way, wow, that's so painful. It's so difficult. And here's, in our ideal world, assuming you know everything we build goes perfectly, here's like what that journey is, and just to use that to frame all of the work, right? So it's like we're talking about a particular feature, we're talking about particular ideas. You just go back and ground it in like, what does this do to help you know get us closer to this ideal way where people aren't you know stumbling through this problem that they need to solve? Um, and I think that oftentimes you know like that is the product. You know, I don't I, like a lot of times people might think of like. Design is like a, an aspect, or it's like, no, but I believe in design the way that Steve Jobs believed in it, which is like, ultimately, design is the user experience. It's like you are like trying to figure out how to make this product uh, achieve its goals for the user or the particular audience um, that you set out to achieve. So I think it's just a matter of actually talking about everything that you do, all of the product decisions in the lens of like, why is this going to be better for the people that we uh, care about or that we chose to build for? on leaders sharing their views on things like environmental policies or the recent abortion laws? Do you think that's something leaders shouldn't do in case they alienate people on their team who might have views different than you? Or, or what is your opinion on that? I think my opinion is probably, um, you know, a company at an org or team is just, it's nothing more than like a group of people, right? And and the leader is like maybe the person who started it or is the person, you know, who sort of, um, you know, uh, people look to, right, to, to kind of set the, the goals or the norms for that company. And so I think the most important thing is people should be authentic to who they are, you know? And I don't think there's, I think that's probably, you know, and I think there are, there are things that, you know, you could do like, yes, you could, you know, spew hateful things and that's definitely bad or you, you know you could I think um, uh, 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 you know be disrespectful or you know uh, exhibit particular qualities or traits that yeah will likely alienate you with people but if you you know truly believe or care about something um, and it's just it is a part of your identity or it's a part of who you are then I don't think that you know you, you I think it's you know and then you choose to build this and you know lead in that manner, um, with this group of people, with the values that that you you know want to espouse, then I think you should probably be true to those values and um, not necessarily you know put on a mask or hide or try to be something that you're not. So I have a question, um, especially when you're building a product um, that could have potentially different user groups, but your target audience is kind of very hard to get. But you have the other user group to which like it could potentially grow to which is more easily accessible, but the product will look very different based on which choice you make. What do you do in situations like that when you don't? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the most important thing with any sort of new feature or new product is to be really, really clear about the target audience that you're going after because that does shape all the decisions that you make. And so I think without knowing maybe more about the specific details or context, it sounded like you know you sort of said, we had a particular target audience, and that was the problem that we set out to solve. Yeah, um, they were which is very hard to like that target audience. It's like we were looking at the private event space, and like knowing somebody's birthdays or like parties is very hard when compared to like you know a more generic thing as like you know a sports meetup or something. Yeah, like that. but I think in that case, it's more it's more to me than like did we pick the right problem with the right like likelihood that we could solve this problem in a way that's better than the next best alternative right and so to some extent you know it's like you start with problems and then you have to i think also evaluate like the like like how good is your solution at solving the problem right and so 
possibly, you know, this is a problem you're really, really passionate about, you really want to solve, but you just can't, like, the solutions that you have is maybe not likely to be much, that much better. I, I don't mean, I always like to say uh, not necessarily succeed or fail, because it's not about, it's more about, like, what is the next best thing that people are already using, and how much better is your thing than that next best thing? And if you can't make that, you know, big of a delta jump such that people would change their behavior to use your thing, then this might not be the best fit, right? And maybe, you know, as much as you want to solve it, maybe it's good, maybe the solution's, you know, good enough, you know? And, and so maybe there's a different target audience or that has, where like there's a better fit, you know, where they have a problem, and they're, you're, you have a more, you're, you're, the solution you have is more likely to succeed because it is a lot better than the next uh, best alternative on the market. Um, so I was wondering if you could share some advice about managing up. So as a manager, how do you expect your IC to build a relationship with you? Um, and how do you want them to show you their growth so they are you know, meeting their targets and growing in the way that you guys kind of agreed on? Yeah, I think the you know that's a great question because you know many more of us are going to be reports you know with a manager than even potentially uh, manager down the road. Um, I think the most important thing I'll say you know is that with managing up there, yeah, it is going to be like it's a two way street, but like you should take your career into their own hands and you should be very very clear with your manager about what you care about and where you want your where you like your career to grow and what are the things that. Um, that you know that that uh, great success looks like for you, right? And don't assume your manager knows. Don't assume they're gonna like guess or try and infer. I think you should be extremely explicit about this. You know, tell them, hey, in six months, this is what I'm shooting for. In two years, this is what I'd like. In five years, this is you know to me like the version that I want to work towards, right? Um, and and I think the more open and transparent and honestly vulnerable you can be the better. You know, I think sometimes we shy away from talking about these things because it's like, what if we tell someone our hopes and dreams and then we don't succeed? Then they'll know and we'll be like a failure. So I know that I, in the past, I wasn't always comfortable, you know, like saying what I really, really wanted for myself because I didn't want to like almost seem too, I don't know, like, 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 I, I, like I thought so much of myself that I could get there, you know, but if like your manager doesn't know, they can't help you. <laughs> If they don't know what you really care about, or that you you you're, you know you want to be a manager, you want to lead, you want these types of projects. Like, why should they think then to give you those projects when the opportunity comes up, right? So I do really think the most important thing is just to make sure that your manager is aware of your career goals. I think the second thing is then you can ask your manager explicitly for what you what what you think they could do to help you reach those career goals. And it's great. Like, I love it when people make those asks of me. Because I really want to help them. You know, our incentives are aligned, right? Like as a manager, I want to see you succeed, and so I want to help you get to where you are. You know, unless your goals have nothing to do with the success, it's like are at odds with the success of the team. But most of the time, you know, like they're 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 in alignment. And so, you know, to the extent that you can be like, I want feedback on X. I want you to help me find opportunities to Y. You know, I want, um, uh, you know, maybe like. You, you know your support to connect me with a mentor to help grow with this particular skill, right? Like I think try and be explicit, and make those asks of your manager, and then you know ask your manager for for those check-in conversations. It's like, hey, you know, we talked to, and because once you've already established these are the goals and this is what I like your help with, it becomes easy to then be like, okay, once a month I'd love to check in. I'd love your feedback on how do you think I'm progressing based on those goals that I, you know, shared with you that, you know, you agreed were like good goals for me. And, and, um, and in that way, you know, uh, in that check-in, you can both like express your opinion, like, hey, I felt, you know, like that last month was great, or like I felt proud of X, Y, and Z. It's a chance for you to talk about what you've done, the things you've accomplished, but also to calibrate with your manager. So, because you don't want to get to a situation where you think you've done amazing work, and they think you've done not great work, right? You, you like it's always best to be able to, um, I think, try and be calibrated uh, and uh, to have those conversations so you're not surprised. You know, then I think the the right things happen. I've enjoyed your uh, tweets and posts around the, the value and importance of feedback, and really important feedback. I'm curious when you're hiring, especially designers, how, if, if at all, are you checking to make sure they embrace feedback, they have the growth mindset, and then secondly, once you decide to Just feedback between the new hire and the manager, but also between the peers. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, this is definitely a huge part of our interview process, and we want to understand that a person is, you know, um, uh, has that growth mindset and, and that, you know, is able to, uh, you know, uh, operate well with critique because you're, as a designer, your, your work is going to get critiqued, right? Everyone has an opinion about design work, um, not just designers. And so what we do in the interviews is oftentimes, you know, we ask people to take us through a portfolio, and I think one great question is always like, and if you could go back and do it again, what would you do differently? Because you want people to sort of admit that, you know, there are growth areas or they've gotten feedback, you know, afterwards and that there are things to improve. If someone's like, it's perfect, it's like usually a red flag because they're not, you know, thinking in, in that kind of uh, uh, manner that's like all about kind of con continual or, or better improvement for, for a particular product. Um, I think the second thing we do is, you know, when we critique other products, right, where we look at like Spotify or we look at, you know, Google Maps, it's usually then, we, it's like, because it's more discussion oriented. So, you know, like I might make a comment like, hmm, you know, what do you think about the, not the way that they presented navigational controls and they might say something and I'd be like, hmm, you know, but I, act, like, I thought X or Y, you know, like how well do they engage in that discussion and if it feels great and collaborative and natural, awesome side, if like the person, shrinks away and doesn't like it when you disagree with them, like, going to be a problem, you know? Um, so those are some of the things that we look at in the interview process. Um, I think, you know, in uh, most designers, because of just the nature of having, like, if you haven't gone to design school or you have, like, you know, understand that, like, a it's usually not the problem about the critique of the work. Like, designers are usually quite used to um, asking for feedback on work and, and recognizing that like feedback is how your work gets better. Um, and, and so, but I think the thing to try and that we like actually try and create more norms about is feedback about each other, you know, and about behaviors or about uh, kind of the more personal aspects. Cause you know, you could know everything I, I feel about your work, but that doesn't necessarily give you like maybe the insights that you, for how you grow as a person, right? Maybe it's hard to, for you know, you know to draw those uh, patterns of behavior um, on how you communicate, or you know even overall, like you know like what are like how are you progressing your skills around visual design or interaction design? And I think it you know we have to sometimes um, coach and, and remind people to to not always just talk about the work, but also talk about uh, uh, the people and and their development. Thank you, Jay Z, for this talk. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs>